Okay, now, now for the scary bit. Um, inevitably, there are going to be a few numbers on some of my slides, but I thought I'd begin um, by just having a little chat about how we need to take care with numbers. I always like to start with a picture of some underpants, because that, that gets people curious. Um, Alan Greenspan, who's the uh, ex-chief of uh, the USA Central Bank, always liked to monitor the sale of men's underpants to try and get a feeling on the, of the state of the economy. And the reason was that that was one of the first luxuries to go because males, it's, it's considered, uh, are quite happy to get by with tatty underwear. Um, and you know, this actually shows how furiously unempirical economics can be. And uh, there, are, there are other alternative indicators that, that are used. But even when it is empirical, economists happily and, and furiously draw from the same data in order to come to different conclusions. Uh, these two characters are uh, Kyman Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff. Um, they're both Harvard chairs and ex-senior uh, members of the IMF, so respected people and economists. Uh, back in 2010, they, they produced a, a paper based on quite a serious study that showed that once a country's uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio uh, got to 90% and that had serious implications for, for, for its growth. And this study was actually widely regarded as helping to lay the foundation for the West move to austerity economics. Uh, about two months ago, uh, a, a student at the University of Massachusetts was actually doing a, a, a piece of coursework and used this study uh, to, to, to underpin his coursework and actually found when looking at the spreadsheet that these two guys uh, used in their study a serious error in one of, in one of the rows, a, a serious coding error. Um, so for example, the data from a whole five countries were, 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 was missing. Um, now whether that would have affected their conclusions is, is a bit of a moot point, but a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon and then suggested a whole load of data manipulation, uh, selective uh, exclusions and uh, um, unconventional weightings. And as a cost consultant who's often asked to benchmark buildings. It makes me feel slightly uncomfortable. Um, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is the US agency tasked with calculating the gross domestic product of the country, has just changed the way it calculates that figure. So now it's going to include what it calls intangible assets, which is things such as uh, money spent on research and development, um, Hollywood films, stage plays, um, books and, and the like. Um, and that's going to add about 3% to the value of the US economy back in the base year 2007, which is something like $450 billion. So quite a, quite a major change to, to that figure. And we sort of all kneel at the altar of these sorts of figures that we get bombarded with on a, on a daily basis. But we, we need to take care of them. And the reason I show the gherkin in this is, you know, when that building was conceived and even completed, who would have uh, known the value that that created beyond its, beyond its site boundary, even within its site boundary. You know, things change over time, and you know, the value of that building to, to London, to, to the country even, is in, in many ways immeasurable. And that's just a, a, another image from it. It's easy to forget, or is it, a decade or so ago, that just the, the heated debates which took place in, in London about the appropriateness of, of tall buildings in the city and, and, and central London um, you know, views are incredibly polarized, um, and data was used on both sides of, uh, of, of the table to, to support arguments, um, arguments which you know, included whether you know, Frankfurt was going to become the new major player in terms of it being a, a global financial center, and this is the death of London as a financial services center. Um, and against this political backdrop, you know, there's a, a, an intense relationship between the, the aesthetics and the performance of, of tall buildings, and, and, and data is used in, in, in those arguments too, and, and some of that data is, is frankly suspect. So tall buildings polarize views. You know, they seem to be a, a ubiquitous part of media in all, in all of its forms, and it, 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 it tends to represent, or they tend to represent you know, the best and worst of capitalism. I mean, there, there tends to be a lack of balanced debate in, in between those, those two extremes. Um, even uh, two weeks ago, I was sitting in someone's reception and I picked up the copy of the latest New Statesman from the shelf and, well, 
and that, that sort of front cover jumped out at me and I thought, oh God, they're even talking about tall buildings as embodying some higher form of being. And actually when you read the article, it doesn't even mention tall buildings at all. I was expecting something about them being saints and sinners, but it, it's actually about religion and nothing to do with towers. So, you know, they, they're, they're represented in many different ways. Um, and it would seem that bloggers, journalists, almost everyone has an opinion, um, often provocative, sometimes playful like this one, um, but sometimes serious. And what, what Nigel was saying earlier, actually, the, it, uh, many of you may be aware of the Skyscraper Index, um, the ex-senior analyst at uh, Deutsche Bank back in the 90s, a guy called Andrew Lawrence, who's now with Barclays Capital, produced this index, um, and he used basically 18th century economics uh, that showed that low interest rates became a magnet for investment, for capital, invest, uh, capital intensive projects, railroads in those days, perhaps tall buildings now. And he came up with this on the face of it, very compelling correlation between completion of the world's tallest building and wide world, uh, widespread financial collapse. Um, Subsequent studies have shown actually a number of failed correlations in, in, in that piece of work. So whereas uh, Mr. Lawrence was uh, using the example, of, uh, for instance, of the Empire State Building in Chrysler as being completed one year into the Great Depression in the States, or Petronas Towers as nearing completion as the Asian financial crisis struck, or more recently Burj Khalifa opening to a fanfare of fireworks as, as the, the current credit crunch hit. Equally, the Woolwich uh, uh, Tower in, in 1913, Taipei 101 in 2004 were completed uh, with, with no coincident recession. And there have also been a number of recessions where tall buildings haven't um, broken new records. But there is a serious point to this graph, and again, something that the Nigel's pointed to earlier, and that is that some of these buildings, in particular the taller and more complex ones, can span more than one property cycle, sometimes two, three, even more. And that can make them hostages to fortune. It's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to judge the market. And that can work very well if you, if you, if you start in a poor market with low construction costs and enter the market as, as, as marketing works in your favor, or it can work in the opposite direction. So a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, as I was moving into our, our new office, I uncovered this article from 1981 in Building Magazine all about NatWest Tower, and it's, it's quite revealing in that it, it, it mentions a number of issues which are perhaps typical of any tall building in London or historic environment. Um, it was regarded as an international symbol for, for a bank that was just become the fifth largest in, in, in the world and at a time when banks were well respected. Um, it apparently took 21 years to get through planning. Um, and, and uh, hit almost to hit a fatal uh, hitch in, in 1974 when permission was refused to demolish one of the low-rise low buildings, which then killed the second phase of the development, but and, and at a time when the permission on the main building had expired too. So, um, but they got through that. Um, and that distinctive plan, well, it was driven by uh, rights to light and, and, and daylighting, and. Uh, it drove that roughly triangular form, which then was crafted into, into that floor plate, and arguments still rage as to which came first, that plan or, or the bank's logo. Um, and there are a number of buildings which shoulder into the site at, at low level, which meant that they had to raise the floor to create that space to accommodate those buildings, um, and then they cantilevered those three interlocking leaves from the, from the central core and then they sort of echoed that motif at the top of the building to create that, that spiral, spiraling effect. Um, and those last two points, well, they're probably well covered by these two extracts from that, that article in the magazine. Um, you know, they were critical that it was, uh, seemed to be uh, designed from, from, from the outside in with, with, with no sort of nod to how the building would work as, uh, as an office. But I guess if we're being sympathetic, given all the difficulties that that, that project went through, and the fact actually that the, the architect reportedly had no formal brief, and it's perhaps understandable that the, accommodate, the accommodation needs of the bank took second place. Um, but also at the time, uh, you know, what, what is this building doing for the public? There are no cafes, no shops. Um, perambulating, you don't hear that word these days, do you? 
um, and, in, and nothing at the top of the building to, that the public can enjoy too. Uh, but this was something that was addressed in the successful refurbishment later on. And if anyone hasn't been to, uh, to, to the restaurant or the bars up in that, in that building, and I recommend you do because it's incredible what they've done to a, a, a small space and how the money pours into that space. So what actually drives form, there are a number of reasons, I'll just mention a, a few. Um, if, you, if you go back to 20s, 30s, and New York and Chicago, and this is well covered by Carol Willis's seminal book, Form Follows Finance, where basically buildings were built equations, developers um, maximized the floor space on their plots within whatever regulations would allow. So in Chicago, in the bottom right there, there were height limits. So uh, this created this sort of plateau of roof lines, which was punctuated by some truncated towers, whereas in New York, there were a series of setbacks at different height thresholds which created this wedding cake effect. And if you fast forward 70, 80 years to London, this what we call regulatory tax is still in effect. And if anything, it's, it's, it's more difficult in London with a number of constraints and intrusions which a number of people this morning have, have mentioned, rights to light, viewing corridors, aviation limits, and, and, and the rest. And, and that, that's an issue. I mean, that creates a number of different forms as these shapes are molded in and around these, in, these intrusions into the airspace and below. Um, and you'll see later that that has an impact on cost. Um, both Canary Wharf and, and the Pudong area of Shanghai are, are examples of air, enterprise zones where you know, there have been government incentives that have encourage this cluster development, and that cluster development tends to be um, headed by a catalyst tower, so Jim Mao in Shanghai and number one Canada Square in London, um, which is then very quickly surrounded by other buildings. Um, you know, now that, that Shanghai is, that, that financial district in Shanghai is held up as a, as a representation of uh, all that's good about China and its progress in the economic world. And in London, that drives very different forms. So the perhaps fatter, more functional towers of Canary Wharf are very different to that whole array of forms that uh, most of which are, are coming along to, to, to central London. And that means they have very different cost profiles, they have very different uh, value profiles, and they have very different demand profiles too. Uh, but these, these issues are not limited to capital cities. So this is Liverpool in the northwest of uh, England where Peel Development's uh, vision is for this, what they call Manhattan on the Mersey. Um, this has been uh, a concept for a number of years. It's yet, it's yet to get the button pressed to, for, for the go-ahead. But the whole concept there was, was to start with a, 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 ca a catalyst as a tower, so almost a loss leader, something which would act as a, uh, a, a destination, and that would be surrounded by more functional, cost-effective buildings, low and high, to, to support the viability. Um, sometimes form is driven by the ideal leasing arrangement. So this building in Chicago, 60 odd stories high, 120 pounds a square foot, by the way, in, in, in a few slides time, you'll, you'll see how that compares to London. It's le less than half the cost of a building in London. But that is all about, you know, classic American model of 45 feet core to glass dimension. And let's get as, you know, within that, let's make the building as easy to build and as quick to build as possible. Um, and, and, you know, get 1.3 million square feet of space on, on, on the site. Um, but at the same time, it's not just about cost. You know, rents there are $28 a square foot for that building, small premium of to get to 30 for higher up. So it's not just the cost, which is the differential in, in, in different geographical locations. Uh, Taipei, um, I mean, the developer of this building is, is reported to have said when asked, why 100, 101 stories? Well, you know, in many ways, 100 stories would have been perfect, but I wanted my building to be more than perfect. So all those things and other issues drive, drive shape. But you know, my, my one mantra that I tell people is actually, you know, particularly when they ask me what's the premium for going taller, actually shape is at least as important as height. The, more, the higher and the more importantly, the more shapely the building then, uh, the more pressure there is on these sort of three points of the golden triangle, cost, time, and floor area efficiencies. Um, and one way of demonstrating, well, actually, and this, this is another uh, graph which shows a lack of correlation between, between height and cost. So the, the red line is height, and the tops of the bars are the shell and core 
costs of, of London office buildings. So you see within each of the low and high rise bands, there's a lack of correlation between the two. There's a jump when you get from low to high, but it suggests there are other factors in place, specification timing, but also shape. Um, and these are not in order of costs, I hasten to, to point out. Um, but you know, remember that 120 pounds a, a square foot, this is sort of a rationalized range for, for landmark towers in, in central London, 200 to 300. You can get examples outside of that range, but you know, it, it does give a good indication not only of how potentially expensive we are compared to other locations, but the range of costs. And you know, what drives that range more than anything is, is, is shape. And that can work in your favor or out of here, but it's also misunderstood. So many people, you know, the shard there is at the top end, but it's actually not the most expensive building. People think it is because it's going to be the highest in Western Europe, but actually that tapering form works very well for it. Not only does it match its respective uses as you go up the building, but actually it creates a, a, a pretty efficient structural solution and, and other design solutions too. Uh, one slide I've been showing probably for 10 years now, um, it just, just to demonstrate the impact of shape on wall to floor ratios, the amount of facade you have for every square meter of, of, of floor is just to compare you know, some of the tallest buildings in Asia with those in London. So you can see a t pretty tight range in, a in Asia. Um, so you know, maybe 30, 32, 34 square meters of facade for, for every 100 square meters of floor. In London, you can be 50, even 100% more than that. So even before you consider the specification and cost of the facade, you know, you, you, you could be actually double the amount. And, and one of the reasons for that is, and these aren't to scale, but those Asian floor plates at the top, they tend to be more regular. So they're interesting buildings, but you know, those floor plates are extruded vertically. Um, whereas London, greater variety of different shapes. Um, that has a value, yes, but it also has a cost, and you need to understand both sides of the equation. What does that mean? Well, actually, if let's just assume your cladding's costing 100 pounds a square meter, and you can debate whether you should be spending that amount on your external walls, but let's leave that to one side. So if your wall to floor ratio is 0.6 as opposed to 0.3, that means you're spending 28 pounds a square foot more just on your facades. If you took the more extreme view and said, well, actually, not only do I want my building to have a water floor ratio of 0.3, but I want to spend 600 pounds uh, on my facade, that can affect the bottom line by 20, 25%. And we shouldn't forget risk. Um, you know, as we said, those, those intrusions in, and constraints in London mean that it can take a long time to even get these buildings to, to, through planning to site before you even start to build them. Um, that creates uncertainty, not in, in terms of trying to predict um, construction costs, but also the market, as Nigel's, the Nigels have said. But also, it makes them difficult to construct. Um, you know, there's a learning curve to all, all of these buildings, and this, this is just an extreme example of that hotel in North Korea, which is always under construction but never finished. You know, it's got no adequate supplies or supplies, uh, no understanding of, of the market. There are potential backers and... and uh, tenants pulling out all the time. So what about the value? Well, you know, London at the moment is receiving a lot of money from, from, from overseas. Um, I, I attended a, a, a session in uh, at MIPIM in, in France a, a couple of months ago, and it was provocatively titled London Capital of Asia, just because that just the sheer uh, flows of money which are coming in, and it's not just Asia, actually, it's from other, it's from Latin America, it's from Turkey, it's from other locations as well. And those people that are punning money here, partly because you know, they see London as stable and a safety deposit box, partly because they want to take the long-term view and they're willing and able to do that, they want a trophy asset and sometimes tall buildings fall into that category. Um, but if you look at capital values and what, what they've done, um, since the turn of the century, well, prime office capital values in, in London, actually we're sort of at the same sort of uh, uh, level that we were uh, 13 years ago, but actually these aren't real figures. These don't account for inflation. If you account for inflation, actually they're down. If you look at residential values, and you know, no matter how you look at it, you know, the trend is up, and the trend is up pretty significantly. So you know, what would have been a, considered a prime value that's, say, 1,000 pounds a square foot five, ten years ago, um, doesn't even register as prime now. Add to that the fact that um, people are buying overseas off plan with cash, and you can see why there's a proliferation of potential 
residential towers in London at the moment. Um, and what's the cost of actually creating that value? Well, from that previous graph, you see for that office, you know, typical is a very dangerous word to use. Um, and they're pretty similar. There are other factors in place, such as a, a contribution to affordable housing or commuted sums. But, you know, to get to something like 1,400, 1,500 pounds a square foot, there's not a great deal of difference between the two. Um, but perhaps there's a stronger link between value and cost on the residential side of, uh, and, and, and in that sector and perhaps more tricks that a residential developer can play with in terms of um, assessing whether you know, th th there's a value that increases the cost, that's larger than the cost of creating balconies, uh, uh, winter gardens, uh, other sorts of amenities too. Um, I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm going to show, shoot through these last few slides, but the, the basic point here is we were challenged a couple of years ago to create a 40-story commercial tower in London for, for half the price. So rather than typical 250 pounds a square foot, 125, and we thought, no chance. Um, after several months of work um, and going around the table asking each discipline to, to, to come up with their optimum solution, and then a few iterations later, we came up with this either this square or rectangular uh, floor plate. And actually, by pure coincidence, that one on the bottom left is ex almost exactly the floor plate of HSBC Tower down at Canary Wharf. Would those sorts of buildings fit a London plot? Probably not. And it's, it's the starting point rather than the answer. Um, you know, this is without any enhancements to create value to, to make it aesthetically acceptable. But the point is you can lose money if you want to. And you know, that money just falls out of the superstructure and the fa facades in particular for all the reasons I've, I've, I've sort of noted. You know, the water floor ratio of that building was 0.28. But it's more than about cost. So as part of the study, we came up with this uh, sustainability evaluation matrix, as we called it. So we assessed some of the key options in a building, whether it be steel versus concrete, fan cores versus chill beams, whatever, and looked at not only capital costs, but whole life costs, um, both uh, embodied and operational carbon, but also more subjectively, but actually perhaps most critically, the building's fitness for purpose, so the, the impact that building would have on its occupants. Um, it's a difficult one to assess, but you know, when you consider that the total cost of a building over its 50 or 60 year lifetime is people, 90% of it is people, then it's something we shouldn't ignore. So last couple of slides. Um, those principles have been picked up by a couple of people, one of which was a, a, a bank in London which uh, has a distra distressed asset and wanted to come up with a tower which was different and differentiated. So they were very keen to explore that. You know, if they started with a very modular um, and rational approach and took a long, hard look at the specification, then maybe they could reinvest that money in, in some of those things that are potentially more valuable to tenants. You know, interesting space, double height space. This is sort of a, a, a duplex office arrangement where um, every other floor is the main floor. Most of the lifts only go to those floors and an accommodation stairs between the two. And then tenants can actually be flexible in terms of that lighter structure, that mezzanine level. You know, that, that can be fill half of the, the floor plate or, or all of it. Um, and so by saving money in some of the key elements, they could either uh, come up with a building that had more competitive rents or that and a combination of actually something which is different than to everything else on the market. Uh, a similar study recently by Picard Chilton and others in, in the States where their approach again is looking at how buildings are used. Um, so you know, trying to reflect workplace trends, trying to reflect the fact that, you know, Productivity and, and, and a pleasing environment is, is the bottom line. And you, know, we, you can do that by introducing atria, by intru introducing natural ventilation and other things, things which traditionally actually cost money and take up floor area. So how do we afford that? Well, we look at modularization, for, for, for example, and maybe the form of the building is driven by the, the ideal dimension to, 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 to suit that prefabrication principle. And I guess in terms of where we go from here, it, it seems almost as if we've tried every possible shape and form and size. Um, and you know, that has created some wonderful buildings. Um, it's also created some utter madness that I've seen on my desk, which thankfully haven't reached reality. But they have a value. You know, shape has a value. It has a cost as well. 
equally, I wonder whether there are other ways of creating that value um, and whether we ought to, rather than just focus on short term, and with, with tenants actually becoming more informed and actually uh, looking more closely at these issues, whether we'll have to anyway. Um, but I think where, where that drives form, I'm not sure, but one thing that will never change is that we need to understand those principles and understand the data and the, uh, how that data is interpreted and work as a team in order to, in order to get to the ideal form. Thank you.